uh, I've been here since uh, 2011. Uh, before I came here, uh, I did my um, PhD work at UMass Medical School. I was uh, focusing on signaling at the time. I um, then went to industry for three years. I saw the error of my ways and I came back to academia. Um, kind of saw the error of my ways a couple of times, but decided to stick around. And I've been working on NK cell immunotherapy for all these years since I've arrived at Minnesota. Um, I work very closely with Jeff Miller um, and with a number of other people. There's a lot of wonderful collaborations that make this research move forward. So today I'm gonna talk about tri-specific killer engagers or trikes. I've talked about these in the past. Um, it's what we do in the lab. Um, but I'm also gonna talk about the environment that NK cells have to cope with in order to mediate anti-tumor functions, um, which is, is something that oddly enough, people don't think enough about. Um, so I'm gonna start with this slide that I'm sure a lot of people have seen before. Um, so natural killer cells are involved in a number of different processes, uh, ranging from reproduction to autoimmunity. They're critical for viral infection. Um, they bridge the innate and adaptive immune responses. But what we really focus on is their role in tumor surveillance and clearance. Um, I think the reason why we started focusing on uh, natural killer cells at the University of Minnesota is because they're very prevalent in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but um, we are starting to move away from that. Um, they represent about 5 to 50 per 15 percent of circulating lymphocytes. I've seen this number change to about 5 to 10 or 5 to 20. Um, they are not MHC restricted. Uh, they don't have any chronotypic receptors, unlike T cells. But also unlike T cells, they don't require any kind of priming. So they contain preformed granules that can mediate killing very quickly. Um, and their activity is basically dictated by a broad spectrum of activated inhibitory receptors. So these are basically the mechanisms of NK cell activation. The first mechanism is what we call natural cytotoxicity. It's basically the natural killer cell recognizing stress ligands on the surface of a target cell. So that could be a viral infected cell or a transformed cell. So natural killer cells have uh, receptors on their surface that can recognize a set number of stress ligands. The second mechanism, which we're gonna focus actually quite a bit today is called antibody dependence on mediated cytotoxicity. Um, and this mechanism, basically a receptor called CD16 that is on the surface of NK cells engages the tail of an antibody that's coded on a target cell, either tumor cell or viral infected cell. We will really talk about CD16 quite a bit. The trike molecules that I focus on are targeted to CD16. Um, and the third mechanism how NK cells get activated is through cytokines. Basically other cells within the microenvironment secrete large amounts of cytokines particularly IL-12 and IL-18 are pretty good at activating NK cells, but IL-15 really enhances that activation. So once NK cells get activated, they mediate their functions for a number of different activities. Um, the most common one that people think of is their degranulation. So essentially when an NK cell gets activated, it releases granules that contain uh, proteins that basically poke holes on the surface of uh, the tumor and then uh, deliver a payload, Grantine B, um, into the tumor, which causes the tumor to die. Same thing for viruses. Um, this mechanism is very quick. It can happen within minutes to hours. The second mechanism that NK cells turn to, particularly when they deplete their stores of granules, is uh, death ligand. Uh, mediated uh, killing. So they contain fast ligand and trail on their surface and they can mediate killing through this um, mechanism. It's typically much slower. So usually what happens is an NK cell kills for the granulation initially. And then once the stores are gone, it switches over to death ligand mediated mechanisms. And the third mechanism that NK cells mediate activity through is for secretion of cytokines. They do this very quickly. I'm just showing interferon gamma and TNF alpha here, but they secrete a large variety of cytokines, which 
essentially activate other immune cells within the microenvironment. Um, most people hate the slide, uh, but it's the main point that it makes is that NK cells, in order to get activated, they have to deal with a number of activating receptors and a number of inhibitory receptors. And if the inhibitory signals are stronger, basically you get no activation. If the activating receptors are stronger, you get activation. So this balance is critical to prevent autoimmunity and to basically prevent the NK cells attacking the own body. Um, but it's a balance that we actively try to break in immunotherapy. In immunotherapy, we're always trying to shift that balance and remove the inhibitory signals and push the activating signals. They have a number of cytokine receptors on their surface. Um, the one that we're gonna focus on today is gonna be IL-15. It's one of the components of the trike molecules, but they can signal for a number of other cytokines. There's plenty of chemotactic receptors on their surface. We're not gonna focus on this very much today. And there's adhesion receptors that are not only critical for um, movement of the cell, but they're also critical for cytolytic activity. So <laughs> I wanted to go a little bit broad today and I wanted to talk about a bunch of projects and the more I thought about it, the less sense it made <laughs> to talk about a bunch of projects. Um, but just broadly, the main issues with NK cell immunotherapy are generally specificity, expansion, you need enough NK cells to kill, persistence and survival. So you need the NK cells to engraft if you're using an analogenic setting, or if you're just focusing on the patient's own cells, you need them to persist and uh, get retained long-term. Um, so the first part of the talk, I'm gonna focus on these aspects. Um, but when this NK cells enter a tumor microenvironment, they're, they have to deal with a number of different insults. Um, the first one, which is gonna be the one we're gonna focus on today is oxygen content. You know, everything we do in the lab is at super high levels of oxygen and normoxia. Um, and the truth of the matter is that in the body that is not physiologic at all. Um, the second issue that NK cells have to cope with, and I will say we have projects going on all these aspects, but again, I'm just gonna focus on this because of time. Um, so the second issue that they have to cope with is inhibitory signals uh, within the microenvironment. We have some ongoing work focusing on PD-1, pd one interactions. We also are starting to test uh, TGF beta traps, but there's a number of suppressive signals present within the microenvironment that basically shut down NK cells. Likewise, there's also a number of suppressive cells that can mediate the signals. We are focusing quite a bit on MDSCs within the lab, but we have a little bit of work on Tregs. We have not focused a great deal on uh, tumor-associated macrophages yet. And then the final issue is migration. And if the NK cell can't get to the site of the tumor, then there's not gonna be any efficacy against it. Although I will ha I have a tiny little vignette at the end that there's a way to basically semi-bypass the migration issue. I am working on these molecules called chemokine beacons that are meant to uh, mediate that migration, but it's definitely a work in progress and it's going slow. Um, so we're gonna start focusing on the general issues. Um, and the way that we addressed all of these issues are from with a family of molecules that we developed with Jeff Miller and Dan Valera here at the University of Minnesota called tri-specific killer engagers or trikes. Um, these molecules originally were composed of a, fra a fragment of an antibody against CD16 um, in which you had the variable light and the conserved light, um, a fragment of an antibody against a tumor associated antigen. In this case, we have anti CD33. And again, this is a single chain variable fragment containing a variable light and a conserved light, sorry, a variable light and a variable heavy and then uh, an IL-15 moiety. The first molecules that we made, we had to mutate the IL-15 moiety because wild type IL-15 didn't work. And the newer molecules that we're making, which instead of having a single chain variable fragment against CD16, they utilize a humanized camelid um, molecule that basically um, only has one single chain. So, Llamas, sharks, camels have all uh, developed 
a different type of antibody. And it, it's thought that they've developed these antibodies because they cope with uh, a very extreme range of conditions. Um, but these antibodies, instead of having uh, two chains, they have just one chain. And what we did is we took this one chain and took the uh, CDRs from an LAMA anti-CD16 and we put them into a humanized framework and it actually works. Um, so all the molecules that we're dealing with now uh, contain this engager. And then we have molecules that either have a camelid version for the tumor antigen or a single chain variable version for the tumor antigen. And we have wild type IL-15. So this side of the molecule is meant to engage and activate NK cells. This side of the molecule is meant to provide specificity against tumor antigens. And this side of the molecule is meant to provide survival, priming, and expansion. So this is just a little cartoon of what these molecules do. Again, they engage the activating receptor CD16 on NK cells, and they engage the tumor antigen, and essentially they form a cytolytic bridge between the NK cell and the cancer cell. It also provides a proliferation signal that mediates NK cell expansion. And the general idea is that we're not only targeting and killing tumor cells, but we're also expanding the cells that mediate the, the killing. Now, the part that we usually don't talk about too much is that the killing goes beyond the trikes. We're priming these cells and these cells have the capability of mediating natural cytotoxicity. So even though CD16, CD16 might go away uh, through clipping, once the NK cells get activated, the NK cell is still able to mediate tumor killing through natural cytotoxicity. So I'm gonna start with what has been our flagship trike, which is the uh, anti-C33 trike. It's a trike that is designed to target AML and MDS. Um, even though we had the advent of anaticlax and a couple other drugs with AML, you can see very clearly in these graphs that the overall survival hasn't improved greatly. And we have an aging population that develops more and more AML as people get older. Um, so there's clearly a need for um, some kind of an intervention in the AML. The other issue with AML, even though we can do transplants to cure patients, um, the more frail the patient is, the lower the chance there is to uh, provide a transplant that will not kill the patient. Um, so what we did is we generated a first generation trike and I'm just gonna flip back that looks exactly like this. Um, it had two single chain variable fragments, one against CD16, one against CD33 and a mutant L15. Um, and we first evaluated whether or not um, this prevented NK cells from dying. And we, in order to compare this to control, we had a molecule that didn't have IL-15, it just had the anti-CD16 and the anti-CD33. We call those bikes instead of trikes. Um, and if we incubate cells for a week with a bike versus with a trike, and we look at a membrane permeability as a measure of viability, we see that the trike provides a lot less membrane permeability. In other words, you have a lot more life cells that um, have a loss membrane permeability when you compare to the, to the bike, where, in which case all the cells have died. Um, I should say, because I don't have the graph over here, if we look at proliferation with the bike, we get zero proliferation. With the trike, we get a lot of proliferation in case of proliferation that we're shown here. And the interesting thing is, even though IL-15 can mediate uh, T cell proliferation, particularly on the CD8s, the trikes basically uh, do not mediate T cell proliferation. I have another graph later on that kind of illustrates that. Um, so we've done this in a number of patient samples and we can see the enhancements in viability and the enhancements in cell division very easily with these molecules. So the L15 uh, moiety is working and it's driving specific survival and uh, proliferation of these cells. Um, I usually show a bunch of uh, activation assays that are in vitro before, but for um, purpose of time, I thought I would jump into the in vivo model um, directly just to show the efficacy of these molecules. 
Um, so our in vivo model is, utilizes NSG mice, which don't have their own immune system. And this allows us to engraft both a human tumor and human NK cells. We utilize HL60 cells as a model of AML, and we have a luciferase cassette. So if we inject the mice with luciferin, the mice uh, it, it irradiate, and basically we can um, uh, measure the bioluminescence. Um, so we inject uh, in this model 750,000 um, uh, HL60s. We usually, and I don't have it here, in the old models, we used to irradiate uh, the mice before. In the newer models, um, we do not irradiate the mice. We just inject directly without irradiation. You take a hit on the engraftment, but on the other hand, you don't have to deal with radiation toxicity. Um, three days later, we inject expanded NK cells in the newer models. In the older models, we used to inject 1 million um, enriched NK cells directly from fresh blood. And what we do uh, is these molecules are very small, so they have very quick PK. So we inject trike molecules five times a week, and every seven days, um, we take blood and assess uh, NK cell numbers in the blood, but we also do BLIs and assess tumor load. Um, so the more tumor that's there, the more luminescence that you have. And as you can see, we have um, tumor alone on the top. By day 14, we have more tumor than with the bike or the trike. But by day 21, you can see that we have dropped already a couple of the mice in the tumor alone. But the bike group, with one exception, which we probably misinjected, um, most of the mice have a lot of tumor there versus with the trike group, we see a lot less tumor. Um, when we look at the blood of these mice, we see almost no NK cells in the periphery with the bike group, but we see plenty of NK cells in the periphery with the trike group. Now, and I know I present this assay many, many times, um, we have a capability in the lab, formerly we did this in collaboration, but now we're gonna internally, to look at NK cell killing in microwells. So we have these chips that have 20,000 microwells and we can load NK cells in there and we can load tumor cells. And what we try to do is we try to load um, enough NK cells. So we have calculated one NK cell per well and three or more tumor targets per well. The tumor targets are green, um, the NK cells are in blue. And when the tumor targets get killed, they basically turn red. So there we go. So what you can see with a trike is that the NK cell moves around quite a bit and kills the tumor cells. Um, so with this assay, we can measure um, the time to first kill. And you can see that the time to first kill for the NK cell with a trike is much quicker than with a bike. Now, if you have nothing, you even have less killing. Um, oops. Uh, we can also measure the displacement, so the movement of the NK cell for the well, and we can see that the L15 moiety is basically mediating more displacement than a molecule that doesn't have an L15 mo moiety. And when we look at the overall survival, this is just a representative one, we see that the bike basically over the course of time of the assay, and this is in minutes, um, mediates very little killing versus the trike mediates a lot more killing and it mediates faster killing. Um, so we've done this a number of times, but we're trying to optimize it to use it in the lab. Um, but we were pretty convinced that this molecule was functional. So we decided to move it to a, a phase one clinical trial in which we were dosing patients with um, refractory uh, AML and MDS uh, with trike molecules in three blocks. Each block consisted of uh, four 24 hour doses back to back IV. Um, and that was done specifically because these molecules are so small and they have such a quick PK. Um, we let the patients rest for three days and then we dose again with a second block, rest three days and dose again with a third block. Um, and the main point of this phase one was to look at safety, but of course, we're always trying to look at biologic signatures and whether or not there's any efficacy in there. Um, and the main thing that we took from this trial was that indeed we were getting pretty good activation of the NK cells, as you can see here by uh, CD69 expression. Um, and you can see that it happens in peaks. Um, so day three obviously is during the uh, infusion 
day eight is right before the next set of infusions. Um, so meanwhile, the infusion is in place, you get pretty good activation. Now, one of the things that we see with therapies that um, basically utilize IL-15 is that the cells uh, exit the um, periphery and go into the tissues. So essentially what we see when we count NK cell counts is when we're dosing, we see very low NK cells, but when we wait to the day prior to the next round of dosing, we see this big peaks on NK cell numbers. And essentially what we saw is that as we increase the dose, um, we expanded NK cells quite a bit. So it was a good proof of concept that this was mediated NK cell expansion within the patients. Now, when we look at expansion by KI67 of NK cells versus CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, we saw early on that you primarily get NK cell expansion, but you get some CD8 T cell and CD4 T cell expansion. But by day 15, the only expansion that you're seeing, and so the only active KS67 signal that you're seeing is on the NK cell. So we're pretty excited about this. Now, 12 patients were treated, going from uh, five micrograms to 155 micrograms per kilogram. Um, we didn't really see any DLTs. There was a no grade one uh, CRS. Um, we got three blast responses and one blast conversion. So the patient had C33 blast and a little bit of C19 blast, and then it converted to just uh, C19 blast. Um, and like I said, we saw robust NK cell expansion, but you know, it was good, it wasn't fantastic. So how do we improve on this? Um, so this is where the molecule redesign came into place. Um, we hypothesized usually when we clone these molecules that have single chain variable fragments, what you get is you express a chain of these molecules with a single chain variable fragment against one of the uh, engagers on this side and the single chain variable fragment against the other engager on this side. And if it falls sufficiently, you will get the variable light and the variable heavy of the anti-CD16 together and the variable light and the variable heavy and the anti-CD33 together. But what we think is happening is that the molecules are folding inefficiently. And this is basically uh, producing a decrease in activity from IL-15 and also a, a decrease um, in activity against the tumor. So we swapped out the anti-CD16 SCFE and put a camelid anti-CD16. And what we saw when we did octet analysis, we saw much better binding affinity against CD16A and CD16B with the camelid than what we see with a single chain variable fragment. So we thought that molecule would be better. Um, when we look at NK cell proliferation and these next graphs, the second generation trike, which has the camelid, will be in purple. The first generation trike will be in blue and the control alpha theme will be in red. So when we look at NK cell proliferation, we saw that the second generation at all doses tested um, so we're going from 0.5 nanomolar to 50 nanomolar, had better activity than the first generation in terms of driving proliferation. Now, when you look at T-cell proliferation, you actually see almost the opposite, but it's not quite significant that the second generation is inducing less proliferation than the first generation, and definitely less proliferation than wild, wild type IL-15 by itself. And the reason for that, we think, is because we have more affinity for anti-CD16, so we're delivering the molecule better. If we look at high proliferation, so proliferation be beyond three peaks, these differences are much more um, uh, robust um, when you compare differences between the second generation versus the first generation. Oops. When we look at killing using an incuside assay, which basically measures uh, live cells at these different time points using a microscope. The cells are, in this case, cell trace labeled. So we have HL60 cell trace labeled cells. We see that the second generation trike mediates more killing than the first generation trike, which is more than IL-15 by itself. Um, and when we go back to our tumor model, and I actually should have swapped these slides because this is, um, using the uh, radiation, actually this experiment was using the radiation. Um, it's same model as before, but we radiate the mice before and we're using enriched NK cells. Um, what we saw was that we get a lot more radiance, so a lot more tumor load, 
with the first generation when compared to the second generation trike. There's a 130 fold difference at 90 micrograms. It decreases to 12 fold difference at 30 micrograms, which seems to be the optimal concentration for the first generation trike. And then at 10 micrograms, the difference is even lower. So we see a pretty robust difference in in vivo tumor killing and in vivo tumor control. And we also see a robust difference in NK cell expansion when we compare the second generation trike versus the first generation trike. So that basically um, prompted us to switch to the second generation molecules. And just going back to those general concepts that we're trying to hit, the trike induces um, specificity. And I'm gonna talk about different molecules that are in the pipeline right now uh, against the tumor. It certainly induces NK cell expansion and induces NK cell survival. Now we have a number of these molecules um, that we're working on. Uh, probably the one of the biggest ones, which I'm not gonna cover today, but we have been focusing on quite a bit um, with a number of different researchers in the lab is B7H3. We have a camelid against it that works very well. And we find expression in a number of different tumors. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly later on about TEM8. Um, we are also uh, starting to generate new molecules that target CD133. Um, in terms of heme malignancies, uh, of course we're targeting C33, but we've uh, published on CLEC12A and we've published on CD19 and we're working with Ryan Betts on CD83. So you can see that we're targeting a number of different things. And what we hope is that we're gonna be able to leverage these molecules to target a number of different tumors. Let's see how we're doing on time. Eh, halfway time. Um, so like I mentioned before, the first part of the talk focuses just plainly on how we activate these cells to bypass um, this general uh, limitations. But the second part of the talk is gonna focus particularly on the limitation that's mediated by oxygen content within the tumor microenvironment. Um, there's been publications before showing that hypoxia induces a number of defects on NK cells. Um, and the main defects that are, have been published on before have to do with cytotoxicity and with proliferation of the NK cells. There's been work using uh, HIP1 knockouts that demonstrate that if you knock out HIP, uh, sorry, HIP1 alpha, um, you get better activity against the tumor. And HIP1 alpha has been highly described within hypoxia as one of the main regulators of immune activity. Um, but we wanted to explore um, what hypoxia does to NK cells more. And the sad truth is that the grand majority of researchers utilize normal, and I don't know if it's a sad truth, that's a bad way of putting it, but the truth is that most of the research that we do is utilizing standard incubators. Um, so these incubators have 20% oxygen in them, and we don't see that anywhere within the body unless you're focusing on the lungs or um, the dermis and top of the dermis. Um, but the truth of the matter is in the body in circulation, you, usually what we see is about 12% oxygen. In the bone marrow, there's a gradient, but we calculate about 5% oxygen. And in the tumor microenvironment, it can be anywhere from 0.3% oxygen to about 3% oxygen. And so in order to mimic uh, these conditions, we partnered up with a company called Excel Bio that um, generates these incubators that are they're small incubators. And the big thing about them that is different from tri-gas incubators is that they can change oxygen content very quickly and very accurately. In a tri-gas, you know, if you change the oxygen content and you decrease it to about 1%, once you open the door, it takes about 40 minutes. Some of them take longer and the oxygen content varies quite a bit within the tri-gas. In these, you, you can open the door, you can put your cells in, and within a minute, you can get down to 1% oxygen. Um, they're very accurate. We can also change pressure within these incubators. We have looked at that. That question is a lot more complex and we haven't figured out how pressure affects the NK cells um, yet, but we are thinking about it. Um, so they provide a fantastic model to basically carry out studies to explore um, what different oxygen concentrations do to NK cells 
and what we can do to basically um, mediate better anti cell function within different microenvironments. So this is essentially the setup. You know, we have incubators that are 20%, we have incubators that are 12%, 5%, and 1%. In a lot of the studies, we're just gonna focus on 20% and 1%, but we've done all the conditions. And what we do is we enrich NK cells, we plate them, we put them in the incubators for a set period of time ranging from 24 hours to seven days. Then we take the cells and we'll look at proliferation, we'll look at phenotype, we'll look at cytolytic activity, um, metabolism, gene expression, and whatnot. And using the setup, um, when we looked at viability, this was one of the first surprises that I had. I thought we were gonna lose a lot of NK cells when we put them in hypoxia. And while we lose some, it's not statistically significant. So the majority of the NK cells survived. Um, now, when we look at an XMV, we see the same thing. There's basically not a huge induction of an XMV. Um, so you don't get an increase in apoptosis. But when you look at proliferation, particularly when you're using one nanogram per mL, which the one that we're using induces pretty robust proliferation at this concentration. When you compare 20% um, versus 12%, you don't see any differences. Versus 5%, you start seeing some differences, but versus 1% oxygen, you can see the proliferation is basically shut down in the system. So when we look at NK cell count, that mirrors what we're seeing. When we look at cytolytic activity, and again, this is a um, incuside assay. So in yellow, we have 1%, and blue, we have 20%, purple, 12%, and green, uh, 5%. You can see when we're looking at natural cytotoxicity, so NK cells basically killing tumor targets just based on the stress ligands on their surface. Um, so the target in this assay is K562s, which are a great tool for looking at NK cell natural cytotoxicity. You can see very clearly that um, at the 1% condition, you basically lose most of your natural cytotoxicity versus at the other conditions, you maintain natural cytotoxicity. And this is just a summary of a number of different uh, experiments. This is just a representative one. Um, when we look at ADCC, so antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, we essentially see the same thing. We're losing most of uh, the ADCC at 1%. It is retained pretty well at 12% um, and 20%. At 5%, you lose a little bit, but it's not super consistent. So hypoxia basically induces uh, decreased proliferation, induces in decreased cytolytic activity. We wanted to figure out why there was a decrease in cytolytic activity, and we're lucky enough to have uh, Pippa Kennedy in the lab, who was an expert in microscopy. So she jumped right into it, and she started evaluating the formation of the synapse and movement of granules uh, towards the synapse. Um, so over here, she has LFA1 to kind of look at the synapse. There's a nuclear dye, um, there's a dye for the NTOC, and there's a dye for perforin that is usually contained within the NK cell granules and it gets shifted towards the synapse um, when the NK cell gets activated. So what we were trying to see is, is there a change in that movement of perforin towards the synapse um, and uh, in the formation of the NTOC um, when we look at um, this activity in hypoxia versus normoxia. And long story short, basically by these parameters, we don't see a difference. Um, Pippa started thinking about microglia <laughs> recently. So she's gonna um, investigate um, microtubules in a different manner to try to figure out if we're missing out something. But in general, this studies told us that there was no difference in the synapse formation. Um, so we, then we decided to turn to CYTOP to look at uh, different activating receptor components as well as different um, components that are required for NK cell cytotoxicity. Um, so we have this panel that Pete developed in the lab um, that basically contains, the one that we use for here can contain, I wanna say 38 antigens. We have one now that is up to 46. Um, and the neat thing about this technology, which by the way, quick promo, we have a Helios 
that was donated uh, in the cancer center that TTL um, uses for um, doing uh, research studies. We have it up and running. So if you're interested in technology, reach out to TTL. Um, but we wanted to use this technology to basically look at a number of different parameters at the same time in different uh, oxygen conditions. And here I'm just showing you uh, this knee plots. So basically it's a way of organizing the data. Um, each point is a different cell and the cells cluster based on their receptor expression. Um, what we're looking at here is the gradient of expression of NKGTD versus the gradient of expression of perforin. Red is a lot, blue is very little. Um, and so what we wanted to look at are there changes in the expression of activating receptors and of perforin over different um, oxygen content. And I think it's a little hard to tell from some of these graphs, but I think the answer is yes. I'm gonna show the aggregate data later. Same thing for perforin. Basically we just see a decrease in perforin as uh, we decrease the oxygen content. Um, so we use this technology to look at a number of um, different markers. And essentially when we look at grants on B, which is basically the payload that's delivered to the synapse um, and enters the cell and mediates cell death, uh, tumor cell death, we see that there's a big decrease in hypoxia. When we look at some of the death ligand uh, mechanisms, we see decreases in a trail, if we do more samples, I bet we will see decreases in fast ligand. Um, we also see decreases in um, transcription factors that are associated with NK cell maturity and NK cell functional activity, like TBAD and umesodermin. Interestingly, we see increases in activating receptors CD25 and CD69. CD69 has been associated with hypoxia, so that one makes sense. CD25, we're still trying to figure out. We also see decreases in activating receptors on the surface of the NK cells. So NKG2D, NKP46, and NKP44 are all down. And if we did more replicates of NKP30, I bet we would see that going down. CD16 is kind of all over the place. We don't really see a big decrease there. And we looked at one inhibitory receptor here, NKG2A, and that one is actually down, but inhibitory here are actually up. So the activating receptors are down, the inhibitory receptors are, some of them are up, and the molecules that are needed to mediate cytotoxicity are down. So we think that these are the things that are mediating and decreases in cytotoxicity. Um, we wanted to look at gene expression, and this is a very simplistic way of graphing this, but essentially um, when we look at differences versus 20% oxygen, at the 12% oxygen content, we see almost no differences in gene expression. 5%, we start seeing some differences, particularly early on at day one, um, but those differences are pretty much gone by day seven. And when we look at 1%, we see quite a bit difference in the number of genes that are uh, differentially expressed. Um, perhaps not um, surprisingly, cell cycle genes are, uh, <laughs> quite a bit different in hypoxic cells versus um, normoxic cells. And DNA replication genes are also quite different. Um, there's a regulation uh, of endocytosis mediated genes in hypoxia. There's also a regulation of mitophagy. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Not surprisingly, the HIF1 alpha pathway is upregulated. Um, HIF has done some stuff with the FOXO signaling pathway. Um, carbon metabolism is also um, uh, altered. So there's a lot of changes that are basically altering the ability of the NK cell uh, to proliferate and divide. Um, and there's a lot of changes in um, metabolism, but surprisingly to us, one of the changes is much higher basal glycolytic activity on the cells that are in hypoxia. Now, the reason why I say it's surprising to us is because glycolytic activity is usually associated with proliferation and with effector function. So you would think in cells that cannot proliferate and cannot mediate effector function, glycolytic activity would be down. But as we can see in this seahorse, at 1%, basal glycolytic activity is uh, quite high. And then maximal glycolytic activity 
partially because the basal is so high, it's also quite a bit higher than at 20% oxygen. Um, so both, again, basal glycolysis and compensatory glycolysis are altered. There's a huge change in the glycolytic genes when you compare 1% versus uh, 20%. And this is probably one of the most robust signatures that we're seeing on the RNA-seq data set. Um, when we look at mitophagy, so consumption of uh, um, mitochondria, we see that there's an increase uh, in mitophagy in the 1% condition um, versus in the 20% condition. And now you see the opposite when you look at uh, oxygen consumption rate in a seahorse assay where at 20% uh, oxygen, we get pretty good uh, basal OCR and we get pretty nice uh, spare respiratory capacity um, versus 1% basal uh, oxygen consumption rate is much lower and the spare re respiratory capacity is much lower as well. Um, so the mitochondria is not working as well at 1% oxygen and it makes sense because these cells are in hypoxia. Um, so we wanted to evaluate where the ATP is coming from uh, in these cells. So Upasana uh, did an assay with PIPA um, looking at uh, where the uh, ATP is coming from, if it's coming from mitochondria or if it's coming from glycolysis. And you can see that at 20% oxygen, the majority of the ATP uh, found in the cells is coming from the mitochondria versus a little bit of it's coming from glycolysis. Conversely, at 1% oxygen, the majority is coming from glycolysis and a little bit is coming from mitochondria. Um, when we measure overall ATP, we see a decrease uh, in hypoxia. We've looked with uh, Peter Crawford in his lab at uh, AMP and a number of other um, metabolic uh, readouts using their assays. And we can see a decrease in AMP. There's... Um, differences in the NAD um, metabolism that I don't fully understand, so I didn't add over here, but we're probing other components of metabolism, um, which are also altered. Um, going back to the mitochondria, uh, Pippa did some imaging, and <laughs> you can see some of the representative slides over here. Mitotracker is in this uh, teal color at 20% oxygen. You can see plenty of mitochondria in there. When you look at 1% oxygen, the amount of mitochondria is much lower. Um, when we uh, uh, pull the data and we look at mitochondrial surface and a mitochondrial volume, we see a pretty robust, this, uh, pretty robust decrease uh, in mitochondrial surface and mitochondrial volume. Um, in the 1% oxygen condition. Again, um, going back to the oxygen consumption rate, this kind of explains that, and it does align uh, with the uh, upregulation of mitophagy genes. Um, we looked at mitochondrial membrane potential, and the membrane potential is much higher in 1% oxygen, and the amount of reactive oxygen species uh, in 1% oxygen are much higher we think these cells are a lot more frail. We have not done the hydrogen peroxide experiment yet where we're uh, stressing the cells with it and trying to see if there's differences in cell death, but it's uh, in the works. So we wanted to figure out how do we bypass some of these issues that we're seeing in hypoxia. And historically, we've done a lot with IL-15 in the lab. It's been in several clinical trials. Obviously, the trig molecules contain IL-15 in it. Um, and it does mediate uh, pretty good NK cell priming, proliferation, and activation. So we asked a very simple question. If we increase the amount of IL-15 within the culture, will we rescue uh, some of these uh, deficits that we're seeing in cytolytic activity and proliferation? And the answer, <clears throat> excuse me, Going back to the answer, the answer is yes to a certain extent. Um, so over here we have in the circles, um, high dose uh, IL-15, oh, sorry, low dose IL-15 um, in hypoxia, um, high dose IL-15 in hypoxia, and we have 
low dose IL-15 in normoxia and high dose IL-15 in normoxia. And essentially what you see when you increase the amount of IL-15, you basically revert natural cytotoxicity to what you would see with low dose IL-15 in normoxia. You're still not able to maximize uh, natural cytotoxicity, but you do rescue a bit. Now, when we look at proliferation, basically high dose IL-15 doesn't do anything. We're not mediating more proliferation. So we are altering slightly uh, cytolytic activity and we're rescuing it slightly, um, but we are not uh, rescuing proliferation at all. So I can tell you, we haven't figured out the proliferation question, um, but going back to what the IL-15 does, um, we wanted to ask, well, does this change where the uh, ATP is coming from at 1% oxygen? Is that the reason why now we're seeing cytolytic activity? And the quick answer is no. We're still seeing the same um, ATP profile with high dose IL-15 as, as what we see with low dose IL-15. So it seems like the ATP um, doesn't seem to be the reason why we're um, getting this increase in cytolytic activity versus if we look at normoxia, when we add high dose IL-15, we get a lot more glycolytic ATP. We do not change the mitochondrial ATP. With the hypoxic cells, it seems that they can't increase the ATP. So this might have to do with the reason why we're not getting proliferation. Basically, we're not able to increase that um, glycolytic content beyond what it is at basal levels. Um, so just going back to the trikes a little bit, we wanted to ask, can the trike basically rescue some of the cytolytic activity? Um, so we utilize a trike that Gwen Fung in the lab is focusing on against PSMA. And we wanted to evaluate if we put cells in um, hypoxia with IL-15 or with PSMA and then take them out and put them in a cytolytic assay. Again, C42 cells, so uh, prostate cancer cells that express PSMA um, and are nuclide red labeled. Can we see more killing with the PSMA trike and is it rescuing some of the um, deficits that we're seeing in hypoxia? And I should say, and we're going back and redoing some of these assays, I should say that this assay, the assay itself, when we're looking at the cytolytic activity, for all the assays that we've shown before, it's actually done in normoxia. It's not done within these incubators. Now we have new incubators that actually have a impedance system inside them, so we can do the cytolytic assays in the new incubators. Um, but these assays that I've been showing you thus far, the cytolytic assay is done after seven days in hypoxia, we take them, we put them in normoxia within this incubator system and look at killing. And somewhat to our surprise, when we look at um, normoxia and we look at the differences between IL-15 mediated killing versus the trike, the trike clearly induces more killing. Um, but when you look at the natural cytotoxicity uh, 20% and you compare it to 1%, you definitely take a hit in natural cytotoxicity. So there's less natural cytotoxicity at 1%. The thing that was surprising to us is that the cytolytic activity mediated by the trike seems pretty close to what we see in uh, normoxia, which indicates to us that at least in terms of cytolytic activity, the PSMA trike in this case is rescuing a lot of the issues that we're seeing in terms of satellitic activity. And it might be because you're combining both the IL-15 signal with a very potent uh, ADCC signal. It might be the targeting of the IL-15. We're not sure yet, but it's a way to basically get around um, some of the issues that we're seeing within the tumor microenvironment. But you know, I, I'm starting to think about, it, it seems like the NK cells entering the tumor microenvironment, they're gonna deal with a lot of barriers so can we utilize NK cells within their environment where they mediate the, their maximal uh, immunotherapeutic, at least historically immunotherapeutic value, which is the bloodstream. Um, so we started uh, looking at a molecule called TEMI, which gets upregulated in the tumor endothelium. 
And it's very specific to the tumor and the billion. It also gets upregulated in tumor stroma and it's expressed in some tumor targets. But what we wanted to evaluate is, can we generate trikes against you know, these uh, targets that are within the tumor endothelium and target the tumor endothelium directly. Um, and <clears throat> to do this, we basically looked at a number of different human endothelial cells and mouse endothelial cells. Temate is very conserved, so it actually hits um, um, mouse endothelium. And essentially, when we increase the amount of Temate, we get more NK cell degranulation and more uh, NK cell mediated interferon gamma secretion. Um, as the, uh, purport, as the concentration of the TEMA trike increases. Um, so what this tells us is that NK cells will degranulate uh, against um, mouse cell lines. Now, when you put these cell lines, this endothelial cell lines in culture, they upregulate TEMA. We don't know exactly why, but they do it. But what this told us was that we could actually look at a mouse model where you have human tumor, but you're gonna have um, mouse endothelium going in. Can we target that? And that is precisely what we did. So Michael Kaminsky, we just published on this very recently. Michael Kaminsky, who's now in Yale, um, decided to uh, generate a tumor model in which we're adding A549 cells uh, subcutaneously into the mice. Um, we wait for 14 days until we can measure the subcutaneous tumor. Then we add expanded NK cells and we treat uh, with a trike against temate, which has the Camelid anti CD16 and a single chain viral fragment against M8 um, for several weeks. Then we harvest the tumor and we look at the tumor endothelium using C31. And essentially, this is what the stain looks like within um, a mouse that received equifunctional L15 versus uh, this, what the stain looks like in a mouse that received M8. And the mice that receive equifunctional L15, you can still see the endothelium in there. And when we use a mask, it's a lot easier to see versus the ones that receive the anti tem antibody uh, trait. Um, there's a lot less uh, CD31 staining. Um, he enumerated this. Basically, he um, took the sections and he got some different fields um, and evaluated the amount, the intensity of the mask in each of those fields. And essentially what we saw was that using the strike, we can decrease the endothelial density within the mice. So I'm very interested in this because it's a way of bypassing the need for an NK cell to actually enter the tumor microenvironment. So just bringing things back, um, like I showed you, NK cell function and proliferation is strongly reduced in hypoxia. Um, there's a decrease in activating receptors and functional molecules that we think drives the reduction in cytotoxicity. Uh, basal glycolytic uh, metabolism is really amped in the hypoxic NK cells, um, and it cannot be altered by addition of IL-15 at least. High dose IL-15, and especially the trite, seems to enhance killing hypoxia. And Trikes could be used to target the tumor vasculature in order to bypass the need for the NK cells to function in hypoxia. So, like I was, everybody always says it takes a village. You know, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, Jeff Miller. The uh, trike uh, platform was developed in conjunction with Dan Valera. Um, we're working with Peter Crawford and trying to figure out what's going on with metabolism. Um, we're rookies at that end of the spectrum. Uh, we do a lot of work with TTL and Bionet, and I wanted to acknowledge the collaborators in Excel Bio, uh, James Lim and Xu Yang Feng. Um, the main people that did the uh, hypoxic work are Upas and Arvindam, who's in industry now, and Pippa Kennedy. Uh, Wen Feng uh, focused on the PSMA um, trike, and Michael Kaminsky worked on the um, uh, to make trike and you know Peter Hinderley developed the uh, trike panel. Um, both Alex and Bayhia worked on the uh, C33 second generation story as well as Todd. Um, so yeah, um, we'd love to take questions right now. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I have two questions about the traits. The first is, can a single trait be bound by both CD16 and the IL-15 receptor? 
That is a great question. We think so. And the, the reason we think so is we've utilized um, a cell line called NK92s that can have expression of CD16 or you can have them without expression of CD16. Now we do this bioassay in the lab that is essentially evaluates um, an ADP conversion um, and the cell signal through L15. So if you use the cell line that doesn't have CD16, you, get, uh, you do get a metabolic signature, but it's much weaker than when you use the cell line that has CD16. So we think that they're both binding at the same time and that the binding for the CD16 specifically is enhancing the delivery of the L15. The other piece of data that we have that they, find, that they both find is that we get much better proliferation on NK cells than we get with T cells. T cells, again, particularly CD8s, can signal through L15, but when you have it in the context of a trike, you actually don't get proliferation of those cells. So yes, we think that both are binding. Right. And my second one is, uh, you may not know the answer because you didn't make the trike, but it's a quality control issue. Are mm -hmm. these made in bacteria as insoluble proteins that are refolded? Yeah, so the there's two stories that we showed there, actually three stories. The original trikes, so from the anti-C33, are all made in bacteria. Those were made by Dan. Um, and there are issues with refolding there. So basically, when you make them, um, to get them out of inclusion bodies, you have to do this yeah. very strong uh, acid uh, treatment. And then you need to refold them. The newer trikes are all made in um, mammalian cells okay. and they get secreted. So you don't have to refold them. I was them. wondering about lots of much variability with the refolding, but if it's inside, uh, I think there is lot to lot variability on both ends of the spectrum. You know, we're, I, I would love to say that there's not, but yeah, for sure, we see differences in activity. Yeah, no problem. Scott? Just kind of building on Chris's question, are very steric problems with, with these trikes and are there like binding rules that you started to explore some structure activity relationship or anything like that? Yeah, so we, we really do think that there's uh, steric issues. That has been um, playing around quite a bit with different uh, linkers uh, that are more flexible or are, um, more rigid. Um, some of the linkers really don't work sometimes, but surprisingly, a lot of linkers work well the other reason why we think that there's steric issues is because depending on the trike, so depending what's flanking that IL-15 molecule, we really change what's happening to that IL-15 signal. So we think that some of them are folding wrong and we haven't done anything structural. I would love to do some crystallography and try to evaluate how they bind to um, the tumor antigen and whether or not they're folding differently. Um, but we really haven't looked at that very closely. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's steric issues going on there. And then, then when these trikes are administered in your body, what are some of the PK liabilities? And I mean, does it stay as an intact molecule and how's it excreted? So they're pretty small. So the majority of the trikes that I've shown you are anywhere from 66 kilodaltons down. So the near generation ones are around 40 to 50. Um, so they get clear for the glomerous very quickly. So the PK is around two and a half hours. We think that they're still functional within the body. Um, we've done some assays where we're taking cells from patients and then doing chromium release assays against targets that have CD33. And you do get like an increase when you compare before the, the dosing. Um, so we think that they remain functional we are working on newer families of molecules to basically bypass that issue. And a lot of it is increasing size, but also uh, basically using things like uh, serum albumin writers and things like that, that will bypass that issue. We are just now starting to test those. We haven't gone into the mice yet to try to see if that's the case. But yeah, it's a huge issue. Yeah. See, it's not letting me open it. Oh, sorry. Uh, generating. No, we have not. It would be cool to do. So the the question is, yeah, it's super <laughs> tiny. I can barely read it. Um, 
some John Belcher was asking if we have thought about generating oxygen on the NK cell surface to enhance function and proliferation. For example, adding a catalase uh, to the trike to generate oxygen in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, John, we have not thought about it, but it, it sounds like a pretty good idea. So <laughs> we'll, I'll talk to Yvette later and see if we can do something like that. <laughs> yeah, Jim. I mean, the NK cells go through the lymphatics. And so the, the third mechanism that you were talking about where they can then educate, once they do whatever mm -hmm. they want to do or can do, then they go educate the friends, yeah. uh, T cells and whatnot, the adaptive system. Does that happen? In the yes. So the, the answer is yes. And they, they change quite a bit when they go into the lymphatics. So the NK cells that you typically find in lymph nodes look kind of different than the NK cells that you'll find in the periphery. They usually don't have very much CD16. They are much brighter in terms of their CD56. Um, but it's thought that those NK cells mediate uh, different activity that is more inflammatory rather than tumor targeted or antiviral. One, one more question. Mm -hmm. So I'm a cell adhesion guy, as you know. Yeah. And CD56 is also known as NK. Is it important for how these things traffic? I mean, do, do they use it to adhere or migrate or? Yeah. So there's a researcher in New York, her name is Emily Mays, that focuses on that very question. And what she's shown is that CD56 is very important in the maturation of the cells. She actually has this super cool movie showing um, CD56 going to the leading edge of an NK cell um, and basically probing the environment that it's on. and Helping the well, sorry, these are all in vitro um, systems that she's showing. Okay. Um, but the point of her systems is that for NK cells to mature, they need to mediate a signal through CD56, okay. and that signal is also associated with the movement of the NK cells. So, if she sees a lot of NK cells moving through that leading edge, um, she usually sees much better um, maturation. When you take that out of the equation, they don't mature as much. Now, when the NK cells are mature, it's not super well known what the CD56 does. Um, but, you know, when NK cells proliferate, they upregulate CD56 quite a bit. And when you can, when you find them within uh, tumor tissues, CD56 is usually upregulated in those as well. Do they, I know I said one last question, but there's one here. Yeah, yeah, no, go for it. Do they give the neurons? Through their, to the NK on the neuron, is that, and um, so you usually don't find them in the brain unless there's some insult to the blood brain barrier. That blood brain barrier. Um, we Frank Saihaki and um, uh, Sacker Davis are collaborating, and Jeff, of course, are collaborating with Clark Chan in a project that we're figuring out how to inject these directly into sure. the brain. And they're focusing more on iPSC-derived NK cells, um, which are slightly different beasts. The, the short of it is they can mediate um, pretty good tumor control in the brain. Um, and they have some really neat models. And the B7H3 trike actually enhances that quite a bit too. Um, but naturally, they wouldn't be there. So the, the, no, the question is whether it's like whether they can promote the heat in the neurons, but if they're not in there, then... yeah, I don't know, I don't know uh, because, yeah, I, that's not their natural environment, but so I don't know. All right, All right. thank you.